Hello and welcome to the Invictus Podcast. Today we spoke with Alex, co-founder and CEO of Nansen. Our conversation covered a broad range of topics from NFTs, the future of the market and some trading insights. We hope you enjoy. How's it everyone? This is uh, Invictus Capital. I'm Gary Chait and this is Jason. Today we have live is Alex from Nansen. Uh, really excited to chat to him. Uh, just quickly, Alex, you want to give us a two minute intro on who you are and what you do before we get into some exciting stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm the CEO and one of three co-founders at Nansen. My background is in artificial intelligence. Worked a few years in management consulting um, as a data scientist, data science manager and then uh, basically jumped headfirst into the crypto space in 2017. So I've been working in the intersection of data and crypto for the last four years. Uh, and we started Nansen in 2019. The um, premise of Nansen is that we think that on-chain data is very valuable and we make that on-chain data even more valuable by enriching the data with our own proprietary wallet labels. And that allows our customers who are typically, you know, crypto investors, um, hedge funds, market makers, VC funds to discover investment opportunities through, you know, inspecting blockchain uh, activity and also perform due diligence on those opportunities and get alerts when certain events happen in real time. For example, large transactions of tokens, um, you know, lots of funds being moved from point A to point B. Uh, and and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's a quick overview. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, just a, a quick one. Me and Jay are both traders, so um, we have traditionally used Nansen for DeFi purposes. But just to get on the topic that everyone's talking about, and what I really think put Nansen on the map, if it wasn't already on the map, is is something called NFTs and NFT paradise and. It's pretty much a collection of all data and a lot of signals that if you really had time to sit, sit on the Nansen Discord, sit on uh, the Nansen interface, play around on NFT Paradise, you could really get in early at some of the biggest projects. And uh, I just want to know, was that a natural like progression or six months ago did you say, all right, let's take a strategic decision and, and just pile into NFT data or did it sort of happen organically? I saw someone call us the Bloomberg of JPEGs the other day <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny um, yeah so I mean you know it's always a bit of both with crypto you have to always think ahead a little bit at the same time it's literally impossible to say what the crypto space will look like you know even even three two three years from now right so it's really hard to say what will uh, take off uh, I've personally been an investor in the NFT space for a while. Uh, one of my best investments has been um, investing in Axie Infinity in the seed round, for example. So I've kind of been you know, interested in NFTs for a while. This year, we saw that there was kind of a resurgence of NFTs. Of course, they've been around for a while, uh, right? Since 2017, I would say, when CryptoPunks and CryptoKitties were created. But uh, we, we had some people who joined the team who were also incredibly interested in NFTs. And uh, in particular, one of our research analysts, Paul, is really interested in NFTs. And when he came on board, the first task I gave him was to build what we then call the NFT God mode. So the equivalent of token God mode, but for NFTs. And I think we were a bit fortunate with the timing because this was just when NFTs were like starting to take off. Uh, and, um, you know, he did a, an amazing job building out NFT Paradise, NFT God Mode, and uh, the NFT section uh, of the wallet profiler. So I think we were, you know, certainly a bit fortunate with the timing. Um, and, you know, as with everything, there's, you know, part luck and, and part skill. So I think uh, the fact that we keep in touch with, like, the grassroots and, and the broader crypto community, I think is very important. And that allows us to focus on the stuff that people actually care about. So I think we picked up pretty early that, you know, NFTs are actually on, are, are actually top of mind for many investors. One thing that I've um, always enjoyed about Nansen is a very community focused project, um, like community first. And, and a lot of your principles are aligned with that of the broader crypto ecosystem. Um, and since your community is growing so fast now, um, on one hand, you've got like all this really valuable data that you're making public, um, at least at least through the through the platform. And on another, you've got more and more traders that are actually using this uh, information to trade. What do you think of like the alpha decay 
so to speak, of of um, how how like now you've got way more users that are actually taking advantage of this data. I think we're almost at that point with some of the more like entry level on chain data, like say stablecoin inflows on the broader market. Um, how do you see that? I think at some point uh, we're safe because you know in the beginning, you know it might have been you had unbelievable alpha because you were one of very few people using our product. At some point, it almost sort of tips the other way around where you kind of have to have the product because you're missing out if you don't have it. So so I think, you know, I think in that sense, our product will be relevant until the very last person gets a nonsense subscription to some point. Like you just <laughs> need to have, you just need to have the product to understand what's going on. But I think the other thing is that it's also not really the type of product that can only do one thing. and you'd be surprised by the amount of ways that people use the tool in different ways. And if you just think through the sort of combinatorics of the platform, there are so many different parameters you can plug into it and play around with that there's a good chance that you're looking at something that literally no one else has ever seen before. You know, when you're plugging in a specific token and you're diving down a specific rabbit hole because you discovered something interesting, there's a very good chance no one has ever seen the thing that you are seeing right now. So. And this is this reflects the whole crypto market, right? Like crypto is very fragmented, very illiquid in many uh, in many cases. So discovering these small opportunities is actually part of the fun thing about investing in crypto. So I, I don't think it's you know it's, if our uh, product was designed in such a way that everyone saw the same thing and like everyone was guided down the same path, I think it would be a bigger problem. But now there are so many different paths and so many different small you know, uh, corners of the crypto market that you can discover that, you know, I, I think there will always be opportunities to, to hunt down and alpha to be had by using the product. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So Alex, uh, if I had to think of hours in your shoes, I mean, you guys must have a hell of a lot of work because like one thing with EVM machines, you can sort of use the code and you can sort of almost copy paste a lot of stuff. But when it comes to like chains like Solana and Bridges and everything, people are really going to want to sort of track that, especially with gas fees just being absolutely ridiculous. So let's say there's a natural migration from like ETH to Solana for NFTs. How do you now actually have the time and how quick would it take you to then to offer the same functionality for like a non-EVM chain? Great question. I mean, right now the focus is on EVM chains because we think that you know that's the lowest hanging fruits when it comes to blockchains. And also there is a lot of interest in EVM chains like Polygon, Avalanche, uh, BSC, you know, a lot of these chains are EVM based. And um, I think for us, the technical integration, the cost is lower doing it. So we can, the time to market is shorter as you, as you were saying. Uh, but also many users tend to use EVM chains because you can use the same wallet. You can use MetaMask in many cases on them and so on. A lot of the a lot of the uh, infrastructure components can be used in those other chains too. So the focus is actually on EVM chains primarily. But I think there are maybe I, I think Solana is the big one that is not EVM based uh, that we're looking at. And you know we have three different uh, options here. Either we dedicate our own resources that we have currently to uh, build Solana integration and understand the Solana technology better. Um, the other option is that we try to go out and hire people from the Solana ecosystem and you know take them on board and have them lead the integration efforts with Solana. And the third option is to just simply acquire a team that is already kind of further along on building uh, integrations with, with something like Solana. And this is kind of a decision we have to make on a per chain basis. So we're exploring all these three different paths for Solana. And I would say right now, you know, we haven't really uh, started the work on integrating Solana, but we have started engaging with the ecosystem. So speaking to the right people in the Solana ecosystem, speaking to developers that are working on this. Uh, and yeah, so I think, I think, you know, the third path is like an interesting one to explore for us. Um, and I think there are a lot of great reasons why a small team should want to join the Nelson family instead of trying to go their own way. 
Um, you know, but that's that's a conversation I typically would have with the teams directly. I guess that ties back into into my question about the alpha decay. Like you guys are so inundated with all these potential new um, fronts to to tackle, um, and at the same time, like trailing that is the people actually optimizing and and um, getting uh, like sort of scraping all that value out of the data that you're providing. Um, so you guys recently raised a Series A uh, led by A16Z. Um, how's it going, like post raise and? Uh, to what degree um, is this just like fulfillment of what you had envisioned for the company and and how much of it continues to uh, excite you day to day? It's getting more exciting every single day, That that's for sure. Uh, I think I didn't expect us to grow as fast as we have. So, you know, we're almost 40 people in the team. We were three people a year ago. Um, that's That's been, you know, a big uh, surprise in a positive way. And it's driven by you know, growth in, in our customer base. I would, would not have expected that we'd be at the point we are right now when it comes to uh, our revenues. I mean, we are profitable with 40, uh, almost 40 employees and the company has been around for like 17 months, which I think is, is pretty, pretty wild for a SaaS company. Um, so certainly it's been, you know, gone beyond my own expectations. And uh, with A16Z, they were literally top of my list of the investors that I wanted to have on board uh, for the Series A, so I was I was thrilled to to get them on board. You know, pitching to like Ben Horowitz himself was was really fun, and of course having Chris Dixon sign the deal in the end, one of the top VCs in the world. So yeah, and, and they've been very helpful. Like they help us with the hiring. You know, uh, getting their input on strategic candidates that we interview. They've actually helped us like interview some of these candidates. Um, they've helped us with, you know, job descriptions, um, thinking about go-to-market strategy, how to uh, create sales incentives plans for the sales team, um, and then, of course, also discussing some of these acquisition targets um, that I was mentioning earlier. So they're really, really helpful, and I think, I think, you know, we're fortunate that we weren't really that sort of capital hungry, right? I guess we generate revenues already. And so for us, it was more important finding a strategic investor. And I think they have really, they're really the perfect partner for us, given that they have like the internet background, like Mark Andreessen started Netscape Navigator, right? Like basically the first mainstream browser. Uh, so they kind of, they know like the internet space extremely well, but they're also, you know, deep into the crypto space. So for us, having that combination is really, really powerful. Yeah, I can imagine the, the value they add. Um, one last thing on NFTs that I just was sort of always curious about, I don't know, just to get your opinion on. So let's say we take something like um, generative art, like art blocks, where the code is actually in the smart contract and you sort of own the code, right? And then you compare it to another NFT, which has, you know, a link to a file or a JPEG on a server. Do you think that's like an inherent flaw in different sort of uh, NFTs as opposed to the generative art where the code is locked in the smart contract? I do think that um, at some point it does become a bit of a problem that you have the actual art assets stored on some centralized server, uh, potentially. Uh, and would almost expect that some of these projects would, uh, you know, move away from that towards something like IPFS. So, so maybe there's at least three levels, right? You could have your assets stored on some centralized server, just an API, which is kind of the, the worst uh, setup, but it's also very common. The second uh, sort of tier is if you have stored it on IPFS or something like that, which is a bit more decentralized uh, and permanent. And then maybe the the pristine layer is if the code is actually in the smart contract itself in, in that it's generative, like you describe. So there is definitely something more clean and more decentralized about going for that generative art approach, but also not all art can be generative in the same way. So uh, I think, yeah, I mean, there's something that people have pointed out for a while now. It doesn't seem to impact very much like the pricing uh, in, in my experience, I, I don't think it something that people care, you know, that much about. It becomes more like a pet peeve for some people. But one day it might become important if like one of the APIs like goes down or something. And like you now own an NFT with like a broken, <laughs> broken URL on it. <laughs> I think it's something as with all decentralization, you know, it's it's like not a problem until it becomes a problem. 
Um, so, so I think it maybe is something that hopefully the space will sort of move towards better practices, but you might have to see some, some disasters before it actually happens. Yeah, it makes sense. So you mentioned um, with uh, your capital raise that you really weren't focused on being like capital hungry. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, you, your background was in an ICO in uh, 2718 that, that started with obviously with a coin, um, which the tail end of that bull market was obviously very capital hungry and like quick to grab the capital, but then slow to deliver the product. Um, so to what extent did that like shape your view going forward? And um, how, do you, how do you see like the, the sort of potential tokenomics of Nansen, if there were to be any. Yeah, just to be clear, I was an employee at that ICO, uh, so I did not actually go out and, and execute on the ICO myself as a founder. Uh, but, but it was a great experience to see that from the inside, and it was literally at the peak uh, of the ICO mania in 2017-18. And, you know, people were raising money left and right, and uh, many of these teams did not have, like, a thorough plan on what they wanted to do w with the money how to get you know, maximum value out of it, what kind of teams to build, what kind of products they wanted to build. So it definitely shaped me in the sense that that project was you know, undoubtedly a massive failure. And you know, experiencing that, seeing how I think you know, one of the major problems was that the token became kind of like an impediment to the product development. So you know, people would uh, in, inside the company would have great ideas, but then it always came back to, well, how does this sort of power the token? You know, how are you gonna bake the token into this? And I think you know, the lesson for me was that if you have a token at such an early stage, you have to innovate in two dimensions at once, which is really hard. Like it's already hard to try to create a great product. And if you also have to consider how do you make great tokenomics on top of that, that's just really, really hard. So we've taken the approach with Nansen to, you know, raise funds based on equity, which gives us more flexibility. I think you don't have to worry too much about the tokenomics. I mean, we don't have to worry about the tokenomics at all at this point, right? We just have to make sure that, of course, the company captures some value. But obviously, the history of, history of creating business models is much longer than the history of create, creating token models. So we have the benefit of, you know, using something like a SaaS company business model, right? It's really straightforward. And that allows us to focus on the product instead of just, um, you know, or instead of focusing on the tokenomics as well. So that was like the biggest takeaway for me. Um, and then, you know, like creating a data analytics company it's not trivial as well. You know, many people have thoughts on how it should be done, how you can capture value, how do you build a moat. Uh, and, you know, I think we've, we've been smart in that we've kind of followed our own first principles way of thinking instead of uh, doing what everyone else is doing. So from the beginning, we were charging for our product. And many people told us like, you know, that's crazy or, you know, people aren't gonna pay for just information in this way, because very few people were doing that, right? It was kind of like, either you have the free products like Etherscan, CoinGecko, and so on, or you have the really high-end expensive products like Chainalysis, which could be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year. And so we were kind of sitting, you know, in between, although closer to the, the, the free version with our pricing tier. So yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of lessons I took from, from that experience. But the main one was that you shouldn't tokenize too early. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand what it takes to run data analytics because, I mean, you've got a node for every chain. Then you've got to, like, pass all the data. You've got, like, terabytes of data. Then you've got to query it. So I'd imagine when you raised all this capital now, the capital would be deployed in, number one, to attract the talent, but number two, just to get infrastructure, just to accommodate, say, like, BSC, get a node going there, take all historical data, put it in a database, allow, like, you know, customers to quickly reference it. So is that pretty much the most immediate stuff on the on the road back for deployment of that capital? Yeah, absolutely. So headcount is the, the biggest one. You want to attract uh, talent because, you know, we are a software company, but um, at the same time, a lot of the stuff we do requires, you know, brains and hands. So we do need to grow the team pretty rapidly. And we're expecting to 
or we're aiming to hit 60 uh, team members by the end of the year, which means we have to hire, you know, at this rate, like a bit more than one employee per month, per, per week. Um, so that's, you know, a pretty, pretty fast pace. And we, we don't even have an HR department yet, which is pretty hilarious. <laughs> so is there that amount of talent out there? Like, it, or is it quite difficult to, to get that sort of talent in? I mean, it's just going to get harder and harder because there's a lot of, you know, very well capitalized projects in the crypto space. And I honestly, like, while people have been foaming, FOMOing on NFTs, I've been FOMOing on talent, right, for like the last, you know, six to nine months. So I think for us, it's really important to hire great people. And it's, it's going to get really hard to the point where I think there's going to be a massive like M&A season coming up over the next like six to 12 months and maybe even longer than that because many of these well-capitalized companies won't be able to hire enough people and they're just going to have to and they're just going to have to acquire other companies to 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 grow um but yeah so headcount is where most of the money goes but you know we're quickly going to we're quickly approaching the point where we're spending like one million us dollars a year on on our infrastructure right so and that's also just going to continue because as you say there's the costs of like ingesting data from all these different chains, but also building a lot of the infrastructure on top of that, where we aggregate data and we annotate, right, and label data. There's there's a lot of costs associated with that as well, and you definitely could not do this like from your from your bedroom as like a one person team. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's just not possible at this at this rate. You could do like a simple version of it initially, and that's what we were doing at first. But at this point, like the infrastructure is really heavy and, and you know, frankly, quite costly as well. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, we know you got to run, Alex. So just want to say, like, thanks so much. That was brilliant. And um, just the last thing before you go, uh, I know you call the NFTs pretty well. Is uh, anything else uh, on the on the future that we should keep a lookout for? Any other trends? So I think the consensus in my circles is that we had DeFi and now we had NFTs. And, you know, one of the things that might come next is DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, which been, have also been around for years, similar to NFTs. But, you know, there's been a kind of lack of proper tooling infrastructure. And I think people felt that DAOs were initially kind of like a, um, a solution looking for a problem. But with all the treasury that's been gathered in DeFi protocols, DAOs are actually now a necessity. You need to have like governance of, of treasuries, you need to have governance of protocols. And so I think there's gonna be some form of DAO season at some point. I'm not sure exactly what it's gonna look like, but I think that's gonna be a big one. Um, I think probably not right away. Like it's something that you might see take off like next year. Uh, or something like that. But that would be one of the trends I would expect to see. And, you know, you have DAOs already. I'm a, personally a member of, of several DAOs myself. So, yeah. I could potentially see a future there where your the, the two seasons that you, you coined them, the m and season and the DAO season, could potentially uh, overlap. We'll have to see if, if that uh, comes true. Um, yeah, thanks a ton, Alex. Uh, your, your guys' roadmap, roadmap is really exciting and we really look forward to um, what you guys build out. And thanks again for the awesome analytics platform that you guys are providing to the cryptocurrency community. Thank you so much. Nice to talk to you. Cheers, Alex. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. That was a really great podcast. It was really interesting to hear some of Alex's insights. I absolutely learned a lot, and uh, I really can't wait to see what the future looks for Alex and his company. Uh, we hope you all like this. Definitely click the like button and just stay tuned for our next one. See you all soon.